Hello, my name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I want to talk to you about a vulnerability that uh, Microsoft uh, patched uh, last week as part of the August Patch Tuesday. It's CVE 2024-2024. 38063 and the reason this vulnerability is so important is because it uh, allows an attacker to send a crafted malicious IPv6 packet to a Windows system and gain full system access. So let's talk a little bit about this vulnerability, the little bit that we know actually about the vulnerability and then how you can hopefully assess whether or not you have to do something, whether you have to patch your systems in order to protect yourself from exploitation. So really the big deal here is the CVSS score is 9.8. Exploitability is more likely. It's theoretically a vulnerable vulnerability. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. It was originally found by a Chinese researcher, Cyber Kunlun. Uh, that's one of the uh, famous sort of cyber research uh, companies uh, in China. And uh, they had the knowledge of this vulnerability for several months already. And then reported to Microsoft, Microsoft patched it. All current Windows versions are affected. Now, what really matters to us is uh, are we exploitable? Are we uh, vulnerable here uh, for this particular issue? And there are really two things that you have to consider here. One is, are you vulnerable? Then whether or not the exploit is actually the vulnerable system is reachable and whether an attacker can actually discover an exploitable system in your network. So if your system has not been patched with the August update from Microsoft, then your Windows system should be assumed to be vulnerable. However, it also requires IPv6 to be enabled. And that's where things get a little bit more tricky because Microsoft specifically states that you should have IPv6 enabled on the host, even if you're not actively using IPv6. The reason behind this is that modern software, the modern network libraries are dual stack. So they often, for example, use things like colon colon one, the IPv6 loopback address. And if you have IPv6 enabled, then even that loopback traffic would not work. And a lot of sort of link local stuff on the network is often used like the discover services. So uh, that's why you should have IPv6 enabled. But then again, you should you now disable it uh, because of this vulnerability. And with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about how reachable these systems may be. Now, the big question always comes up, now, who's actually using IPv6? Here is a graph from Google where they're looking at traffic coming to their networks. And you see it's about uh, 40, 45%, uh, which sounds like a big number, but notice these little wiggles. And if you sort of look a little bit at the distance between those wiggles, they have sort of a weekly, sort of a seven day period here. And what this really means is there's more IPv6 on weekends. And if you look like at the sort of uh, late December part, there's also a little bit a uh, high plateau. That's like you know, the holidays. So what's really happening is IPv6 is less used in enterprise networks. It's very common in mobile networks in particular. So mobile networks are pretty much all using IPv6. Your cell phone is using IPv6. Home users, many home user ISPs, like for example, Comcast offer uh, IPv6. Whether or not you use it, a different question. Cloud enterprise, that's where you see less, even though some of the cloud providers now started adopting it more. Now, in the past, there's been a lot of talk about tunnels like Teredo and such. Uh, they actually play a much lower role now than they used to. So when you're looking at reachability, you have to look at the entire path. The internet supports IPv6, your endpoint supports IPv6. And that's pretty much by default. Your ISP, I put a question mark here. Many do, not all of them do. The router tends to be sort of the big sticky point here, in particular for home users. It often does not support IPv6. So with that, you know, your endpoint is not IPv6 reachable, even if your ISP supports IPv6 and your endpoint supports IPv6. The same is true for a lot of small business networks. You know, the router doesn't support them, even enterprise networks. That the ISP often does support IPv6, but the internal routing infrastructure in a network does not. The big exception here, and put this sort of at the bottom, is mobile phones. And that also applies to you know, if you have like a, a 
a hotspot uh, type setup, they typically do support IPv6. If you want to check quickly if you have an IPv6 reachable system in your network, well, uh, this is here in Windows. If you're looking for IP config, the important part is you need to have an IPv6 address that starts with two or three. The ones that start with F, not routable. They're just for your link local uh, access, maybe in some odd case for like site local, but uh, they're not uh, routable. Two or three, the first digit two or three, these are the only currently routable IPv6 addresses. So in this case, no 2603, that's like a Comcast prefix here. Uh, yes, you know, uh, this machine looks like it's routable. And then of course you can always do like a ping six to google.com to check if it actually works. The next question, of course, if your host is routable or reachable, how would the attacker find that host? And that's where discovery comes in. And that's a little bit tricky in IPv6. By default, the last 64 bits of the IPv6 addresses are randomized. It used to be that the MAC address was used here. That's hardly the case these days. Sometimes in sort of server or Linux environments, you may still see that, uh, but uh, not sort of in Windows. By default, the last 64 bits are randomized. They change once a day. They change whenever you reboot. Now, they are reachable still for seven days, uh, but yes, an attacker would have a real hard time finding a system here. If you're using DHCP, which is an option with IPv6, then your addressing scheme may be more predictable. That depends on how you configure DHCP. Now, there's also passive discovery, and we have seen this where, for example, Shodan, they put up an IPv6 NTP server. And uh, now hosts that use IPv6, they may occasionally connect to that uh, NTP server. It's part of that NTP pool that a lot of people are using for NTP. And with that, you, know, you may give, give away your IPv6 address. Uh, but these are hit and miss and uh, not really you know, that common for a system that's not really exposed. There's also no simple way to translate an IPv4 address to an IPv6 address remotely. On the local network, yes, you know, with MAC address and such, uh, but not remotely. Some of the tunnel schemes uh, had systems like this. But like I said, tunnels are not really our concern these days. Once the attacker is in your local network, then of course they can do things like multicast in order to find IPv6 hosts. No broadcast in IPv6. So it's a quick summary here, just about sort of whether or not you are exploitable. Check if IPv6 is actually supported in your network. If it's not supporting network, then your risk goes down by a lot. It's probably not worth then turning off IPv6. Just patch. It's probably then easier just to apply the patch than all the risks that you incur by actually turning off IPv6 if you haven't done it already. If you have done, if you're already turned off IPv6 on the endpoint, leave it that way. You're probably fine at this point if it works so far for you. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about what this vulnerability is possibly about. Again, Microsoft gave us very little to work with here, uh, which also makes it difficult to come up with a decent risk assessment for this vulnerability. So this is our IPv6 header. It's actually a lot simpler than an IPv4 header. Most notably for the discussion here, we don't have IP options. IP options have caused a lot of problems, vulnerabilities in IPv4. Even a couple of years ago, there were some you know, Windows and Linux vulnerabilities that were related uh, to IP options. In IPv6, we don't have options. However, we do have something called extension headers. There's a subtle difference here when you're looking at the IPv6 header, where instead of a protocol field, we do have a next header field. Now in 90 plus percent of IPv6 traffic, the next header is like you know TCP, UDP, ICMPv6. But it could be an extension header, and these extension headers, they can be chained, so you can have multiple extension headers. And that's where things kind of get complicated. You run into a lot of the same problems that you had with options when it comes to the implementation here. 
One particular interesting extension header and option here is Jumbogram. So by default, IPv6 packets are still limited to 64 kilobytes, just like IPv4 packets. But when they decided to introduce IPv6, they figured, hey, you know, people may actually want larger packets in the future. So they added this option. It's a hop by hop header. That's uh, the extension header we are using here. And uh, it's meant only for packets with a payload that's larger than 64 kilobytes. And they can only they cannot be fragmented, which really renders this a somewhat unusual and unusable option because you now most of the cases, our networks have MTUs of the 1500, maybe 9,000 bytes. Very few networks are actually able to support jumbo cramps, but the option exists. Now, the tricky thing is now we do have two length fields. We have a length field, a payload length in the IP header, and then we have a length field in the jumbocram options. The RFC requires that for jumbocrams, the payload length is set to zero. However, what if we don't set it to zero? I found, for example, uh, years ago in older versions of Linux, it crashed the system. If you had the discrepancy in the lengths here and in that case, the packet actually didn't need to be larger than 64 kilobytes. You can have a nice and compact packet like the one I show here, and it would easily make it you know, through normal networks. Now, saying normal networks, it would probably get dropped at the router because of these invalid uh, length fields. So extension headers are really tricky. There are rules around them, like recommended orders, the maximum size, two kilobytes per header. And uh, then there are also like the, each header is supposed to show up only once other than destination header, but you know, rules are there to be broken. There's lots of research has been done in the past that you actually can send and route packets with multiple extension headers that basically routers don't care. There are only certain headers that routers really look at, like for example, that hop by hop header. Uh, other headers, they basically just you know, pass along just like the payload. So uh, that is a possible issue here with that integer overflow that uh, Microsoft gave us that you know, by chaining multiple headers, you may end up with sizes that are not reasonable. Uh, typically, like I said, each extension headers can be up to two kilobytes in length. Not all of the extension headers have that flexible length, like fragment header and such is fixed. Realistically, you shouldn't be able to create an IPv6 packet with headers more than sort of seven kilobytes, which is below what you would expect for any kind of integer overflow. But by properly chaining them, by using jumbo grams, you may be able actually to trigger some overflow here. Now, how do you detect possible exploit? Again, Microsoft didn't really give us a lot here to go with. Uh, this is the rule that I sort of use in my network here, a simple TCP dump rule. Basically, what I'm looking for is packets with unusual extension headers. And like I told you, there aren't really a lot of extension headers I typically see. You may see the fragment header, but even that I see uh, hardly ever uh, these days in my network, uh, like entering and leaving uh, my network. Uh, so yeah, basically just check for anything that has an extension header. It's not TCP, UDP, IC, and PV6. I also have this FFO2 colon colon 16. That's a multicast address for routers. And uh, that often sees the hop by hop header because that's being used for some of the multicast management. And uh, that's why I sort of exclude that. You may want to play with this. Like I said, no guarantee if it works. Is anybody scanning for IPv6? Some of our honeypots do support IPv6 uh, sort of as an experimental basis. I didn't see a huge shift here in IPv6 scanning. Others, Cray Noise, I think published, they saw a little bit an increase from some Chinese networks in scanning. It's certainly possible and likely that attackers are starting uh, to build target lists for this. But the passive approach and you're looking for existing hosts somehow advertised that are using IPv6 via DNS or such is probably your best option and as an attacker. The brute force scanning like you see for IPv4 doesn't really work for IPv6. Anyway, that's all I have here. Hope it's helpful. So be careful with turning off IPv6. 
blocking, routing for IPv6 is probably a much safer and simpler way to do it. Don't forget to turn off DNS for IPv6. So hosts that support IPv6 don't try to reach out to IPv6 hosts that they get back via DNS. Uh, that's it. If you have any questions, my email address and is here. You can also reach me via Twitter, Mastodon, various other social networks, LinkedIn, and uh, of course on the Internet Storm Center. Thank